Okay, so today, I, I've decided to keep today's teaching under the umbrella of the ancient Hebrew wedding model. If uh, you've guessed by the picture, guess what parable we'll be looking at today? The ten virgins, the parable of the ten virgins. Now, you can only fully appreciate and understand this parable only after what we've covered in the previous two parts. Now, for those of you who were here, say, just over a year ago, we covered uh, this idea of um, the bride and things like that. So the, the initial what we'll cover, you'll, you may have heard of, but it's good to hear it again. And then we're going to kind of take this a bit further than most people normally do. Um, so without further ado, let's unpack this parable. It's... Uh, to me, it's a very important parable to really understand what's going to happen at the end. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the rain of the heavens shall be compared to ten maidens who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So this verse on its own already should make a lot more sense having gone through part one and part two of the ancient Hebrew wedding model. We know what stage this is in. This is the bride has come to pick up his bride, and they're waiting for that day. Sorry, the groom. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. So let's define terms. I love defining terms. Psalm 119, verses 98 onwards, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever before me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your witnesses are my study. I understand more than the aged, for I have observed your orders. I love that understanding comes from observing the orders, not knowing about them. And I've said this before, you won't fully get a commandment until you walk it out. Like the Sabbath, you can't explain the Sabbath to anyone until you just have to do it and you'll get it. Psalm 119, verses 104 onwards. From your orders I get understanding, therefore I have hated every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So again, we know what wisdom is, but it's now telling us what the lamp is. It's the lamp of the word. Now what is the word when King David is saying this? What's, what's in circular? Well, what's written at that time? The Torah? Maybe judges as well, you know. But that's it. Chronicles and Kings haven't even been written at that point. Psalm 119, verses 130. The opening up of your words gives light, giving understanding to the simple. So that's what wisdom is. On a, on a very basic level. Now, those who were foolish, so those who didn't have the word or didn't observe the word, they may have had it, but they didn't observe it, having taken their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took their oil in their containers with their lamps. What is the oil in the lamp? And you, you'll see a thousand and one different teachings on what is the oil. So let's cover it. Where does oil come from? Olives, thank you. Specifically, crushed olives. Right, you've got to crush it. Hence, this is an old, uh, uh, it's an olive press. Now, what is an olive? It's a fruit. Okay, so let's look at fruits. Matthew 7, 13. Enter in through the narrow gate, because the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter in through it. Because the gate is narrow and the way is hard pressed, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So the word hard pressed in Greek is phlebo, and it literally means to press as grapes or olives. It's this idea of crushing fruit to get its goods out of it. Um, if you look at the bottom, metaphorically, to trouble, to afflict, to distress, the King James word would be tribulation. The way to life is through tribulation, is through hardship. If you're in tribulation, having hardships, you're in a good place. <laughs> but beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly as savage wolves. 
by their fruits you shall know them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every good tree yields good fruit, but a rotten tree yields wicked fruit. So this idea of by your fruits, your deeds, you can tell something by what it shows to everybody else. Let's look at what a good tree is unable to yield wicked fruit and a rotten tree to yield good fruit. Now, what is wickedness according to scripture? Transgression of the law. So it, it's more than just the obvious, you know, rape, pillage, murder. You know, breaking Shabbat knowingly, wantingly is wicked. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what is a tree? Apart from <laughs> scripturally, blessed is the man who shall not walk in the counsel of the wrong and shall not stand in the path of sinners and shall not sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yah and he meditates in his Torah day and night. For he shall be as a tree planted by rivers of water that yields its fruit in its season. Or if you look at the Hebrew there, it's in its appointed time. Whose leaf does not wither and whatever he does prospers so we've defined fruit we've defined trees people are trees and what they do is their fruit so then by their fruits you shall know them not everyone who says to me master master shall enter into the reign of the heavens but he who is doing the desire of my father in heavens again not knowing about his desire but actually doing it so what is the desire of his father in the heavens. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, Yisrael, what is Yah your Elohim asking of you? But to fear Yah your Elohim, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve Yah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being, to guard the commands of Yah and his laws, which I command you today for your good. This is... When Yeshua was asked, what is the most important commandment? He quotes this, that you need to love Yah with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So there's a lot of people that claim to love him. But again, they would be hypocrites. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many mighty works in your name? And then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Anomia. E What's amazing is that even the dictionaries say like uh, Thayer's and um, Mickelson's and Strong's. If you look up the word there, anomia, it literally says without mosaic law. So e e even the dictionaries say it. The, the older ones from say the 1800s. It's a hard one to get around. So, how do we know him? By this we know that we know him, if we guard his commands. The one who says, I know him, and does not guard his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Doesn't say that he's doing it purposely. A lot of people are deceived. But whoever guards his word, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. By this, we know that we're in, in him. By this, by the fact that we guard his commands. The one who says he stays in him ought himself to also walk even as he walked. Speaking of Yeshua. Now, before we get into this, oh, well, I've done my tick box today. Well done me. I love Yah and I know Yah. In the very next section, he says, the one who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother stays in the light, and there is no stumbling block in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. So there's the, you need the combination of the two. You need to guard the word, you need to walk in the command, but you need to love your brother. Now, what's interesting is that I'm, I'm going to paint a broad brush stroke here, very broad. Generally speaking, Christianity has the loving part. They love their brother, generally. Generally. But they kind of miss out on guarding his word. 
The Messianic Torah movement is the polar opposite. They've got the guarding the word, but there's, go, go look on Facebook and just uh, a feast gathering where there's a lot of people and many conflicting views and watch them devour one another. So this idea, let, let's, get in, let's get in the middle, right? Let's get in the river. Okay, so going back, so is everyone with me so far? Everyone with me? If you claim to know him, you've got to keep his commands, which is your fruit, and you've got to love your brother. So let's go back to olives and what else they can represent. In Jeremiah eleven sixteen, it says, Yah has named you, speaking of Israel, green olive tree, fair of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great sound, he has set it on fire, and its branches shall be broken. And this is where Paul draws this analogy of grafting from. Now, if Israel is the olive tree, that means that the olives can also be its people. So on a national level, if, if Israel is the tree itself, the fruit of it would be its people and what they do. Can people see that? Therefore, olive oil comes from the crushing of olives. So this is people being crushed, going through the fires, being crushed by tribulation, being refined by fire, whilst they are keeping the fruit of righteousness and loving their brother. This is righteous people bearing the good fruit of righteousness, being crushed by trials and tribulation, which is what Yaakov, or James, speaks of. Yaakov, a servant of Elohim and of the master Yeshua Messiah, to the 12 tribes who are in the dispersion. Greetings. This is not to the church. This is, you know, this is to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. My friend Curtis, usually uh, he says this, does a child go, when it's received a spank, does it say, thank you, mum and dad, for giving me this trial? <laughs> do, do we do, what do we do, though, when we go through the trials? Knowing that the proving of your belief works endurance, and let endurance have a perfect work, so that you be perfect and complete, lacking in naught. Apparently, if you've not been put through the refinery, through the crushing, you're not complete. Now, um, in the Hebrew, the, this idea, be, uh, Yah says to Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. The Hebrew behind that is tam or tamim, which has this idea of having integrity. So it doesn't mean like be perfect as in have a 100% track record. Uh, Abraham cocked it up a few times, but he had integrity. This is what David had. Though he murdered someone, when confronted with it, he owned up to it. And he, he tried to do the best to make restitution, have integrity. So this idea of you need refining is going to do you good in the long run. So let's go back to Matthew 13. This whole thing of beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Sorry, this is the parable of <laughs> My mind's everywhere today. And he spoke to them much in parables, saying, See, the sower went out to sow. And others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. You then hear the parable of the sower. And that sown on rocky places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. When pressure or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So this is a person, I, I've witnessed people like this. You'll see someone um, come to fellowship for the first time. They have lots of zeal. They're all excited. And they say, I finally found home. And then you never see them again. Because they've come in all guns blazing telling everybody everything, and then trial and persecution comes, and they, they don't know what to do because they're not well grounded. They're not well grounded. Unlike in what we've just covered in James, this is why we need deep roots. This is why we need solid teaching and so that when trials and the refining does come, we can stand and not stumble. I want to, I want to add this in there. People struggle with keeping Yah's commands and they're not even going through persecution? 
Like, it, when Matthew was writing this, this was obviously after Yeshua, what were they going through, right? Torture, being thrown to the lions, the Roman Empire against them. Even the Jews were persecuting them, the believers, persecuted from all angles. And they managed to hold to the end. So when people say, oh, well, what's my mum going to say? Or what's my job going to say? I find it hard to kind of put it on the same level as what these people are going to. You know, this is maybe my character coming through, but my, my compassion runs out after a point on that. <laughs> That's just me. So, taking everything we've just covered, let's now plug this back into the parable. So, the reign of the heavens is compared to ten maidens who took their lamps. So, they've got the word. These ten virgins have the word. Now, five of them are wise. So, they actually do the word. They've let that word become a part of them. They observe it as opposed to just know about it. Those who were foolish had no oil with them, which means that when they weren't bearing the fruit of righteousness. So when a crushing came, they didn't have any oil that came out of their fruit. Why? Because there was nothing there to crush. They Or, like in the parable of the sower, when persecution came, they fled. They, they, they ran away from the press, which means that had they any fruit, it didn't get crushed. But the wise took oil in their containers in their lamps. So the wise, not only do they do the word, not only do they love their brother, but they've been through the refinery, they've been through the crushings, and they've come out the other end. That's a wise virgin. The foolish virgins had the word, but did not bear the fruit of righteousness. Let's throw this out there, by the way. Did the Pharisees have the Torah? What did Yeshua say about them? Whitewashed tombs. So it's not the having of Torah that makes you a wise virgin. You know, having the knowledge is not enough of itself. It's, allow, it's walking it, first of all, and then allowing the Spirit to write that on your heart. The lack of fruit results in no, no oil being produced under the crushing of tribulation or just coward, cowardice. They run away from the trials. Now, while the bridegroom took time, they all slept and slumbered. All of them, the, both the wise and the foolish. Now, I've quoted this verse a lot before, but it's important. What is slumbering in sleep? Isaiah 29, verse 9, pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For Yah has poured the, out the spirit on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes the prophets and he has covered your heads the seers and Yah says because this people has drawn near with its mouth and with its lips they have esteemed me it has kept its heart far from me and their fear of me has become a command of men that is taught this is why the Pharisees a lot of them couldn't see Yeshua I mean they saw him but they couldn't see who he was because they were giving it all the right words they were going to synagogue, they were learning all the Torah, but they were keeping their heart far from him. They weren't allowing that Torah to be written on their hearts. This is how you will meet people in the Messianic and Torah movement. They'll keep Shabbat, you'll see them at all the feasts, you'll see them with their long zizi, and they've got a foul character. Foul character, why? Because it's not written on their heart. And at midnight... This is when the, bride, the groom would come for his bride in the middle of the night. A cry was heard, a tiroua, a great clamor, shofars. See, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those maidens rose up and trimmed their lamps. I, I just want to throw out there, they all slept, even the wise. This is why I believe now, now we're seeing people starting to wake up. I believe that we're in the early stages of people waking up and we're starting to see who is wise and who is foolish. And the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and for you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. This is usually where people stop. And last year, this is where I stopped. 
in, with this parable. Uh, but there's just so much more. The, in, the majority of teaching, even on the Messianic Hebrew root side, will stop at this point. So, okay, you know what fruits are, you know what oil is, go and do it. But th- there's so much more to this parable. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and for those who were ready, went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later, the other maidens also came, saying, Master, Master, open up for us. But he answering said, Truly, I say to you, I don't know you. This should hearken us back to Matthew 7. Depart from me, I never knew you, you who work lawlessness. You have to tie these two together when you get these phrases that pop up in more than one place. So the majority of the teachers will say, okay, well, make sure you keep the Torah. Hopefully they'll say, love your brother along the way. Do good deeds. Uh, you know, do your best through the crushings. And um, yeah, then that's it. Watch, therefore, because you do not know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. There's an aspect to this parable that is overlooked almost every single time. It's that of, instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Buying and selling. This is never explained. I've seldom I see people explaining this. How does buying and selling factor into this parable? And more importantly, what does it mean for us? As you're going to see, there's a lot there. So, Revelation 3. This is our Messiah speaking in full glory. I know your works. He's speaking, if I'm not mistaken, to Laodicea. That you are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. It's this idea of complacency, you know, one foot in, one foot out. I'll just kind of coax along. Because you say, rich I am, and I am made rich, and need none at all, and do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. Welcome to today. I advise to you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you become rich and white garments so that you become dressed so that the shame of your nakedness might not be shown and anoint your eyes with ointment so that you see. So let's look at gold and silver. The words of Yah are clean words. Silver tried in a furnace of earth refined seven times. Pure as pure as can get. Now elsewhere we get, for you, O Elohim, have proved us. This idea of proving something, uh, seeing what, what, basically, does it do what it says on the tin? You have refined us as silver is refined. So his word is silver or precious metals. Now we are equated to hopefully precious metals. Deuteronomy 8.2, and you shall remember that Yah your Elohim led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you. This idea of proving, putting through the refinery, to know what is in your heart, whether you guard his commands or not. If you read on in Deuteronomy 8.2, it says he let you suffer hunger. He let you go through a few trials to see whether you call on him, whether it's in your heart to guard his command. What I would suggest is that these three verses give you a process. You get the gold, which is his word. You learn from it. You read it. Hopefully, that then gets written on your heart. You become that gold. You become holy. You become like him. And then you get put through the fire because there's some filth that needs getting rid of to make you pure, refined. This is a three-stage process and it's going to keep happening over and over again until Messiah comes back. The more we learn from him, the more we begin to look like him. Hopefully, that's the idea. The trials are to see if his word has truly been written on our hearts. This is what we just read in Deuteronomy 8.2. You shall remember that he led you all the way in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what is in your heart. What's in your heart? Are you, are you doing this walk because it's in vogue at the minute? It's the latest new fresh doctrine. Or are you doing it because you love him and you want to be subservient to him? Why do you, do you, why do you obey? What's your motives? With the gold of the word, we can then buy the white garments of righteousness. 
I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you become rich and white garments so that you become dressed. So what does the word do? It tells you what to do. It tells you what to not do. It tells you what, how to be set apart. Now, with that word, you can then, the word should hopefully be making you walk in righteousness. Now, we know what is the white garments of the bride? It's the righteousnesses of the saints. It's the righteous deeds. It's the fruit. So what I'm saying is that get the gold from Yeshua. With that gold, you can get garments. Get the word from Messiah. Hopefully that word should be helping you walk in righteousness. Buying and selling is an idiomatic expression for learning and teaching. And this is, it becomes evident in Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom and discipline, understanding. Now, we, we haven't got like this little hatch booth with like, come and buy your wisdom, come and buy your truth. No, it's an idiom. Go and get wisdom. We can see to buy gold from Yeshua is to learn from him. If the word of Yah is like silver refined seven times in the fire, it's a precious metal. Hopefully that word is precious to you. Learn from me so that you may be righteous, so that you may be clothed in garments of salvation. How much does it cost to buy from Yeshua? Everything. Okay, I'm talking... Okay, it will probably cost you your life. I get that. But what does it cost in monetary value? Nothing. You, thank you. You know, freely you have, you have been given, freely you shall give. In Isaiah 55, O oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, the living waters of the word. And you who have no silver, come, buy, eat. Eating and drinking is another metaphor for learning. Um, come buy wine and milk without silver and without price. In the parable of the wineskins, what is wine? Teaching. Wisdom. The word. What, what uh, expression does Paul use to do with milk? The milk of the word. Come buy wine and milk. Teachings, the word, without silver and without price. You sure gave it freely. You just have to submit to it and you, have to, you may have to give your life. Why do you weigh out silver for what is not bread and your labor for what does not satisfy? There's a lot of hungry people out there. Right now, there's people out there and they just, this is why they trawl through YouTube over and over trying to find something. And all there is is moldy bread, moldy bread, false teaching or partial truth. Listen to me. Don't listen to these people. Listen to me, Shema, and eat what is good and let your being delight itself in fatness. In Ezekiel's vision, he's told to eat the scroll. He's not literally eat. Do you know what I mean? It's a metaphor. Incline your ear. Again, listen. What does Shema mean? It means hear and do, learn. Hear so that your being lives and let me make an everlasting covenant with you. Again, bridal talk. The trustworthy kindnesses of David. So all this is in context of learning from Yah. Freely. Seek Yah while he is to be found. Call on him while he is near. This implies that one day Yah will not be found. Now in Amos, somewhere in Amos... It says that there shall be a drought, but not of water, but of hearing the word of Yah. And I would argue this is why people are thirsting right now. There's a drought for the word. Oh, there's a lot of teaching out there, believe me. I can assure you 95% of it is filth. There's a drought. Seek Yah while he is to be found. Call him while he is near. Let the wrong forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yah, who has compassion on him, and to our Elohim, for he pardons much. This is, this is all learning and repentance. And this is, hopefully, I know this is what's happened with all of you in here. 
You were thirsty, you were hungry, and you went to Yeshua, and you bought gold from him, and you drank from him, and you, you, you ate the good word, and you drank the milk. And now, what's the result of that? You've repented, and he's shown you compassion. Okay, let's take this back to the parable of the virgins. But the wise answered, saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. The wise had bought gold refined in the fire from Yeshua. They had the word, the, the, they had the fruit of righteousness, which is the olives. They had that. With the gold, they were able to buy enough oil. What I'm saying is that they, with the, because of their righteous deeds, because they had the word, they had that, and they went through the tribulation and the crushing, and oil came out. Who here has gone through a crushing and come out better for it? I have. All of us. We, we've, we live this process. They had the word of Elohim written on their hearts, and they had been through the refiner's fire and come out the other end. The foolish hadn't, even though they had the lamp of the word. They have the, they have the lamp, but they've got no oil for whatever reason, whether they're not righteous or whether they run away from the crushing. This means that there's this um, crushing helps you mature. And if we're aspiring to be the bride, you sure is not marrying a child bride. The foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. The foolish only want the oil because of the predicament they're in. They didn't want it before. Just give us of your oil. We need it. We're in trouble. It's a case of too little, too late. We, we saw this with the Israelites in the wilderness. Now we'll listen to you. 40 years was the result. Too little, too late. Not only is the word equated to gold and silver, but so are we. Isaiah 48, 18, see, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. This actually adds an interesting layer to Yeshua's words of, uh, he advises us to buy gold from him refined in the fire. If, if it's the word, that's an easy one to get, but what if it's people that have gone through the fire? And he's saying, buy from me. Now, what's buying and selling an idiom of? learning, teaching, learn from those that have gone through. Let's build on this. Yeshua is telling us to buy gold from him. What I'm suggesting is that another layer to this is gold is people that have learned from Yeshua, they've bought gold from him. The Ruach has written that word on their hearts, they're living it, doing it, they're, they have integrity, they're tamim, they're perfect. They have gone through the refiner's fire, so they've got rid of all the slag, all that filth and impurity, they've gained wisdom and understanding along the way. They've become refined gold themselves. Right, we sang it in, in earlier in the song, refine as fire, I want to be holy. Refine me as silver. What I'm, Yeshua is saying, learn from gold, from people that have been refined themselves. These people are now able to teach others. They've got something to give these people can now help others find the treasures of his word. Hopefully, this is, what, this is my only function here, is to help you find those golden nuggets in his word. You know, sometimes you need a helping hand. I needed a helping hand, and I always need a helping hand. This is why being in discipleship is so important. They can help others get gold from Yeshua so that they themselves can buy white garments. They can help others in their journey and help them in their garment preparation. This is, you know, can we see all these things coming together? They can support others when they're being crushed, sharing in their burdens. Paul says, sharing one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Messiah. Supporting your brothers in the crushing is an order from your king. Proverbs 4, 5, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. We, this idea of buying and learning from others is right throughout scripture. The word there for get is kana. 
to get, acquire, create, buy, possess. This whole thing of acquiring, uh, but it has this uh, sort of hint to buying. What's really interesting, it says of Eve acquiring knowledge, wisdom. Uh, Another dictionary just says to create, to erect, by extension to procure, especially by purchase and causatively to sell, to own. So when it says get wisdom, go and buy. What did Yeshua say? Buy gold refined from me in the fire. The word of Yah is refined seven times pure. But we are going through the refinery and hopefully we should be pure silver, right? The word kanah is used in interesting places in the book of Proverbs. So there's this one, get wisdom, get understanding, acquire, buy. The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. (laughs) And with all you're getting, get understanding. This, This actually flies in the face of having instant direct downloads all the time. I'm not saying they don't occur but they don't occur every single day like uh, the more charismatic side of believers will say. Look, Yah does reveal things, but it's usually few and far between. This idea of get, it means you go and do something about it. This is why I find it frustrating when people just don't read their word. Oh, I don't have the... Make priority. Proverbs 18.15, the heart of the understanding one gets knowledge. They get up off their backsides and they do something about it. And the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. You seek it. Look, did you get to where you are now without seeking? Or did it all just come, you know, handed down to you on a silver platter? There's this idea of um, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. You know, he has given generously. He has given freely, but it took for us to seek him. He wants to see whether you love him. So let's take this now back to the parable. Give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. The wise answered saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell. Go to those who teach and learn. Buy for yourselves. We, we've been around this before. You go and do it. If buying and selling is an idiom for learning and teaching, this adds a whole new depth to this parable. The wise do not waste time and resources teaching the foolish. I'm going to say that again. The wise do not waste the time and resources teaching the foolish. That doesn't mean just like throw everyone else out and just put a wall up. But at some point, you have to go, no, enough is enough. Even Yah did it to Israel, right? Enough is enough. We know this, Yeshua says this, do not give what is set apart to the dogs, nor throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Ever try to show someone something in scripture to only be attacked in return? They take your pearls, they say, that's just filth, that's heresy, and then they actually turn on you. And you were just trying to help. Some people are not ready for what you may have. They're not ready. A lot of people are not ready. I wasn't ready the first time Torah came to me. It wasn't until the following year that I, my ears were opened up in I can assure you that most of you had experiences where you weren't ready for a particular, even a particular teaching or a particular viewpoint. Sometimes there's things that I will not say to an immature believer or a new believer because they just won't be able to handle it or they won't be able to comprehend it. This idea of the milk and the meat of the word. By the way, just as a throw out, what is the milk of the word? Hmm? Okay, when Paul was around, what, what did they have? What's the milk? Torah is the milk. The problem is, is that the modern messianic Hebrew roots movement has made the Torah the meat. The Torah is the milk. This is what back in Yeshua's day, kids were memorizing. 
Now, when you get into the book of Hebrews, that's meat. That is meat. The, 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 the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, that should be your, that's meat. The Torah is basic. Let's not make, th- this is why I say the Torah is the foundation. Just, uh, you know, because some people make it all about the Torah. The Torah is just the beginning. That's your doorway to, that's the beginning of the path to the kingdom door. It's not even the door. You sure is that door. Some people don't want to know what you may have. You'll, inc- you'll encounter that as well. People just don't, la, 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 don't want to hear. Why? When you sh- what does light do? Light either attracts people that are seeking or it makes the darkness scatter. This is why people will attack you. This is why when you throw your pearls before their pigs, they attack you. Because it shows something inside of them that even their own spirit is witnessing to them. Hence the reaction. You will be judged with what he has entrusted you, including time he's given you here on earth. This idea of the parable of the talents. What did you do with what the master's given you? So I'm saying this in light of the wise do not waste the time trying to reach the foolish. If someone's a fool, let them be a fool. This is why it's important knowing what really a fool is. Because it's a lot more than just, oh, well, they don't keep the Torah. I know foolish Torah keepers and wise people that are still trying to figure it out. The foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. The foolish are not even willing to buy the oil. They just want it to be given to them. Notice that. Because what do the wise say? Go and buy from those who sell. The the, the foolish don't even want to go through the process. Just give it to me. Give it to me. I need it now. Give me the magic knowledge that's going to let me into the kids. Some people just want to know the right information for their cause and their agenda. If it's about, this is why we did this thing on being knowledge driven. If someone's knowledge driven, they're a fool. You're wasting your time. Because, you know, this idea of throwing pearls before pigs, it doesn't necessarily have to be just someone doesn't accept something you believe. They can accept it, but then they make light of it. They, don't be, they treat it as if it's common. And it's like, how dare you? Tr- Usually revelation comes from you being crushed. You go through, so deep intimate knowledge comes at a cost. And then people want all this deep intimate knowledge and you give it to them and they're like, ah. they just treat it like the next hidden, like the new doctrine. And again, you're throwing your pearls before the pigs. Some people want all the answers without going through the necessary journey, which is learning and being crushed for those answers. This is why it's so important to bear in one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Messiah. Because when my brother is being crushed, he's going to gain wisdom and insight. And if he can't do it on himself, we're going to support him. And when he comes out of the other end, he can teach us. Your oil is not just for you, it's for your brother's. Right, we're to have all things in common, this idea of. Unfortunately, people want all the knowledge without going through the crushing. And the thing is, if you don't have that crushing, you won't understand the depth of it. You, you, you'll understand it intellectually, but you won't know it. You won't know it. When um, this fellowship was first coming together and I left the previous congregation... Uh, Curtis was discipling me through this thing and there were a lot of things that he would say to me that I got intellectually and I followed the advice but then when I went through the experience I got it I knew it and and I'd say to him Curtis I I understood this before but now I know it I know it like some of you are now starting to know that we don't have to agree on everything we can still be like close-knit You know that. You don't know it up here. It's on your heart. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Is everyone everyone connecting so far? So far, so the gold can be the word. The gold can be people that have gone through that process. Five were wise, five were foolish. Let's add another dimension to this parable. What else does wise and foolish mean? Proverbs 15.31, an ear that hears the reproof of life does dwell among the wise. 
He who ignores discipline hates himself, but he who listens to reproof gets understanding. The fear of Yah is the discipline of wisdom, and before esteem is humility. I've chosen this background because it's like someone running. Now, to be able to run miles and miles and miles, you have to be disciplined. You have to go through training. And it says here, the fear of Yah is the discipline of wisdom. You don't just get wisdom like that. You go through a learning curve. You do things, and hopefully you become disciplined. You become grounded. You grow deep roots. And so Proverbs 8, this is a wisdom speaking. Now go do a study on wisdom and go see the parallels between wisdom and Yeshua. It's almost interchangeable. Now listen to me, you children, for blessed are they who guard my ways. Listen to discipline and become wise and do not refuse it. This means that if you refuse discipline, you're being a fool. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me shall find life and obtain favor from Yah. But he who sins against me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Let's back up to verse 35. Whoever finds me, whoever finds wisdom, shall find life and obtain favor from Yah. In your King James, it will say grace. They will find grace. It's, the, it's chen, is the Hebrew word. That, goes, that tells you that grace is earned. It's not freely given. Mercy and compassion are freely given. But to find favor in someone's eyes, you've done something. You went out and found wisdom. Go do a word study on wisdom and see what that uncovers. Proverbs 5, my son, listen to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, so as to watch over discretion and your lips guard knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drip honey, her mouth is smoother than oil. What's a strange woman scripturally? A false belief system. Israel was referred to as a woman. So women can be nations. Uh, it can be a, a system of beliefs. Her mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. What, go do your homework on wormwood. It's all linked in with idolatry and sinning with a high hand, purposely, knowingly sinning and thinking you'll be fine. There's a lot of that going on today, by the way. Oh, yeah, you can do it. It's all covered under the blood. Well done. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of the grave of Sheol. She does not consider the path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know it. So now listen to me, you children, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not come near the door of her house, lest you give your splendor to others and your years to one who is cruel. Lest strangers be filled with your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Then you shall howl in your latter end when your flesh and your body are consumed. Sounds a bit like a lake of fire to me. And shall say, how I have hated discipline and my heart has despised reproof. Bear in mind, in this passage, wisdom is being personified as a woman. And it's being contrasted with a strange woman. Um, Think something foreign, something outside the camp. And I have not heeded the voice of my teachers. And I have not inclined my ear to those who instructed me. By the way, this passage should be a clue that Mystery Babylon transcends everything. It's something far... Anyway. Again, Yeshua's words should be ringing in our ears. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Remember that this can be his word. It can be people that are the walking, living word themselves, having gone through. And they've become like Yeshua. So that you become rich in garments. If you... If you Ignore that. If you spurn it, you're a fool. He has given us the Ruach to help us become refined gold. He has appointed anointed people to help with this process. This is what Paul speaks of in Ephesians 4. 
And he himself gave some of his emissaries and some of his prophets and some of his evangelists and some of his shepherds and teachers. Now, we've covered this before, that these were the gifts that the groom would give to his bride. Now, in the ancient Hebrew wedding model, these were, you know, precious jewels, nose rings, bracelets, refined gold. Make the connections. These are the gifts from the groom. It's refined gold from the fire. For the perfecting of the set-apart ones, to the work of a service, to the building up of the body of the Messiah, until we all come to the unity of the belief and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah, so that we should no longer be children tossed and borne about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men in cleverness and to the craftiness of leading astray. This is a sign that we're not ready. <laughs> you know, you just watch people hop from doctrine to doctrine to doctrine to doctrine. It, sh- it means they're children. But maintaining the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, Messiah, from whom the entire body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the working by which each part does its share. Everyone has a job to do. Everyone does his bit, causes growth for the body, for the upbuilding of itself in love. People all too often say they will accept reproof and discipline from Elohim. Everyone likes to say that. Oh, yeah, if Yah was to discipline me, I'd sure listen. I'd sure listen. What happens when Elohim sends a person to do that? Is Elohim right now walking around on the earth? Literally, not metaphorically, literally. No, he's not. So how is he working? He sent prophets, evangelists, teachers. He's using people. This is the pattern throughout. He's used people. So what happens all of a sudden when someone sends a person, Yah sends a person to reprove and correct you? We, we just read it. The person that had listened to the strange woman, oh, how I have not listened to my teachers and those that were t- trying to give me correction. These are the same people that claim they hear directly from the Spirit and don't need a teacher. I'm not saying the Spirit doesn't deal directly with you. He does. But we, we've gone through this, you know, the modus operandi of how Yah operates with his people. He will work with you, but he's also made this a team game. These are also the same people that pour over hours and hours and hours and hours worth of YouTube teachings. I'm not saying that YouTube teachings are bad, but when you live on internet land, internet land is just like the outer ring. That's just the very outer thing. Where's, Where's the intimate fellowship? So it's funny, you know, they claim to hear directly from the Spirit, yet they have to go and listen to teachings. If you truly hear directly from the Ruach, just stop listening to teachings, right? You don't need teachings. You're hearing directly. Look, I'm not saying stop listening to teachings. I'm just trying to expose some hypocrisy here. To those who do not heed the wisdom and discipline he gives us, however that takes shape, whether it's through circumstance, whether he has to, you know, wake you up, send a few curses, as it were. One often reproved, hardening his neck is suddenly broken and there is no healing. (laughs) He will win. You know, Jonah resisted and resisted until he caved in. It broke him. It's a lot easier to just bow the neck and just let that pride just die than to harden your neck because he he will get his will and desire, whether you're part of it or not. And later the other maidens also came saying, Master, Master, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly I do not know you. This is, Michael, you're being a bit harsh Messiah is going to kick, he's going to prevent a load of people coming in. And I don't want that to happen to people. I don't need that blood on my hands. So let's take all of that 
Back to the parable. So being a, being a fool is not, not, is not accepting correction and reproof. Whether it comes from Yah, whether it comes from an anointed and appointed. Give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise, those who had bought the gold from Yeshua, those who had been refined by themselves, those who had taken correction and reproof, no, there would not be enough for us. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. The foolish virgins had not heeded the discipline and reproof from the master of the house. They were fools. Even if you pound a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with a crushed grain, his folly shall not leave him. Again, go back. This is why the wise do not entertain the foolish. The wisest man on earth that ever graced this planet is telling you uh, the folly will never leave a fool. It takes Yah to turn a fool into someone wise. Reproof enters deeper into a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. And when it's talking of blows, it's talking of a rod. When you, when you got a public punishment, you would get beaten with a rod. That's what it's talking about. And what was the maximum you could have of lashes, blows, 40. But they made it 39 so that they wouldn't accidentally go over the limit. 100. This is, I hope you see the extremism that the writer of Proverbs is trying to say. Even, he's talking about two and a half death sentences. That's the sort of parallel he's trying to... The foolish virgins had not heeded the discipline and reproof from the wise virgins because Yah will use people to reprove you. I've been reproved by people and he uses the most unlikely people. They'll say something and it cuts you to your heart and you know it's him speaking through them. Leviticus 19.17, do not hate your brother in your heart. Reprove your neighbor for certain and bear no sin because of him. We're to reprove one another in love. So before people take this as the opportunity to go and tell everybody what they've done wrong, counter this with what Yeshua says. And why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not notice the plank in your own? If you're going to go reprove someone, make sure you do it righteously, because you need, you need just as much reproof as they do. There's a difference between being the Torah police and lovingly reproving someone in love. Some of you have reproved me, and you've done it right. Again, let's go back to the parable. The wise do not waste their time on those that are not willing to accept reproof and correction. This is why, like, I'm not saying stop sowing seeds, but... If you're getting nowhere and if they're purposely turning, you know, turning their back on you and they're trampling on your pearls and they're making light of them and they're not accepting correction and reproof, stop wasting your time. Okay. The wise do not entertain the foolish. It doesn't mean they give them a chance. You've got to give everyone a chance but by their fruits you will know them, right? The wise is saying, go to your teachers, let them feed you, right? The wise answered saying, no, indeed, there will not be enough for us. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. I used to take that as, oh, just look, we haven't got time, just quickly go. I would argue that they're saying, go to your teachers. You didn't listen the first time. Let them feed you. Let them give you your oil. You didn't want it now. You, want, you went to those people before. Go to them. Let them deliver you. Where is their sound teaching now? Because these are virgins, right? And they have the word. So they were clearly doing something, listening to something. They just obviously not let it right on their heart. It wasn't good quality. Where's that sound, sound teaching? How is it helping them now? By the way, this happens on both sides of the riverbank, right? I'm not picking on Christianity. There's equally on the Messianic Torah observance side. 
Jeremiah 5, verse 30, an astounding and horrible matter has come to be in the land. It's not out in the pagan nations, in the land, his people called by his name. The prophets have prophesied falsely and the priests rule by their own hand. And my people have loved it so. And what are you going to do at the end of it? Micah 2.11, if a man walking after wind and falsehood has lied, I preach to you of wine and strong drink. Remember, tie this to Isaiah. Why do people sleep and slumber? It's not because of wine and strong drink. It's hypocrisy, false teaching. He shall be the preacher of his people. He's basically saying if someone's teaching error, they're going to love it. Why? Because you get to do what you want. It doesn't circumcise your heart. And guess what? Heart circumcision is painful. Again, these people are running away from the trials. Give me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. Again, where's the reproof? Hearing what you want and not what you need? Judges 10, 13, but you... This is Yah speaking to Israel. You have forsaken me and served other mighty ones. Therefore, I do not save you again. Go and cry out to the mighty ones which you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. Cross-reference that. You'll find loads of verses like that. Again, the wise said to the foolish, go to those who sow. Let them give you oil. Isaiah 57, 13, when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind shall bear them all away and a breath take them. But a breath, oh, he comes with the sword of his mouth. Sorry. But he who takes refuge in me shall inherit the land and possess my set apart mountain. Wow. He who takes refuge, he who goes through the process, not only does he inherit, you get to possess the set apart mountain. Where he dwells. Ezekiel 13. My hand shall be against the prophets who see falsehood and who divine lies. They shall not be in the council of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel. And they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the master Yah. Because, yea, because they have led my people astray, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And when one is building up a wall, see, they are coating it with whitewash. You're a whitewashed tomb. It all looks great, it sounds great, but it's not doing a work on the inside. And I shall throw down the wall you have coated with whitewash and bring it down to the ground and its foundation shall be uncovered. He will show it for what it is. Where's your sound teaching now? It shall fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst of it, and you shall know that I am Yah. Proverbs 1, this is wisdom speaking. Again, the personification of wisdom. Like I said, wisdom and Yeshua are pretty much interchangeable. Turn at my reproof. The word turn there is shuv, teshuvah. This is where we get the term repentance from. Turn at my reproof. Be wise. See, I pour my spirit out on you. I make my words known to you. This is what Messiah does through the spirit. This is your renewed covenant right there. Because I called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one inclined. And you spurned all my counsel and would not yield to my reproof. Let me also laugh at your calamity. Mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm, your calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, let them call on me, but I answer not. Let them seek me, but not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yah. They did not accept my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, let, this is pearls being cast before pigs. Therefore, let them eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own counsels. If you love your false teachings, have them. This is what the great delusion is all about. Who sends it? Yeah. Why? Because they did not love the truth. For the turning away of the simple slays them and the complacency of fools destroys them. This takes you right back to Laodicea. Complacency, neither hot, neither cold. The foolish virgins had been buying worthless gold. Fool's gold, eh? (laughs) We always used to go in with fool's gold. I've got some gold. (laughs) 
Their faith was not built on a solid foundation. Why? Because when the crushing came, they ran. They had no oil. When tribulation came, they couldn't stand. Thus, no oil is produced. However, the foolish loved the gold they were getting. In 2 Timothy 4, we're told that there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching, but according to their own desires, they shall heap up for themselves teachers tickling the ears. You know that a good convicting message can be an ear tickler? People like hearing, you know, like Charles Spurgeon, for example. Spurgeon gave solid, hard-hitting stuff, but people love it for the sake of... Time and time I've seen... Uh, a good sermon being, being given and the people have gone, oh, preach it, brother, that was amazing and next week, back to square one. Nothing's changed. Oh, but it was a great sermon. Teachers tickling the ears. Why? Because they hurt. You can hear truth. It's all about whether it sinks in from our thick skull down into our heart. And they shall indeed turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths. And go, write it before them on a tablet. This is speaking to Yisrael, his people. And inscribe it on a scroll that this is for a latter day. So this is spoken to us now. A witness forever that this is a rebellious people. Lying children, children who refuse to hear the Torah of Yah. That means that, remember what Shema means. You can hear it physically, but they're not doing it. You're not Shema'in who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us what is smooth, prophesy deceits. Turn aside from the way, swear from the path, cause the set apart one of Israel to cease from before us. Fools appear in every denomination. Every single denomination. It, it, it's, it's a man problem, uh, like, and I mean mankind by that. It's a mankind problem. There are many fools in the Messianic and Torah movement. I hope that's now more evident because people will say that, oh, them silly Christians, they don't keep the Torah. Look at how foolish their eyes, like, not realizing they're a fool themselves. They don't accept reproof, they don't accept discipline, they don't allow that Torah to be written on their heart. That's foolish. A fool has the word, but doesn't walk it out. They have the word, but they do not let the ruach or the spirit work on their heart. So this is, you, you may have all the truth and all the... This is what Paul is referring to. Though I have all knowledge and all prophecy and all the... If I don't have love, it's all for nothing. Put it back into the marriage covenant in this shadow picture... This, uh, if a woman marries a man for his money, is there love? Does it mean anything? No, it's just a sham. Second Timothy three five. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. Turning away, they turn away from these. This is Paul saying: if someone has a form of godliness, but they're not walking in it, they're not actually they're whitewashed tombs. They look all righteous. But then you, when, you, when you walk with them and then you start to see their true colours come out. This is why walking with people is so, so, so important. They do not accept reproof and discipline. They think that they will get to the wedding feast by having the right accolades. Oh, well, I know so and so. I'll be fine. I have one of the greatest teachers in the whole wild world. I'll get in. They think that they can fake it. Just do what, you know, just coast on by. It might not even be intentional. They're doing this like subliminally. They think they would be just fine. Ah, oh, yeah. It, it will all pan out, right? Are the virgins the bride? Go back to the ancient Hebrew wedding model. Who are the, who, the what are the virgins in that model? They're the bridal party. They're the bride's friends. The ones that would stand outside the room when the thing is being consummated, right? The virgins are not even the bride. The bride just got smaller. Are the virgins in the camp? Yes. 
they are in the camp. There's fools in every denomination. I would argue there's wise, or people blossoming to be wise, and I say that loosely. <laughs> How many virgins are there? What does 10 signify? The tribes. <laughs> again, the bridal party just got even smaller again, which means the bride has got even smaller. There are fools in the camp. Wheat in the tares? The bride just got a whole load smaller. So after everything we've covered today, is, you have a rough idea of what it means to be wise. That just means you get to be in the bridal party. Things that make you go, hmm. Will you buy gold from Yeshua? And will, th- th- that means the word and from people that have become refined gold themselves or in the process of. Will you allow the Ruach to write the word on your heart? That means going through the crushing. It means tribulation. It means being put in uncomfortable places and having to trust on him. Will you go through the fire to be refined and made pure? Um, we, in this, today we've been using the form of metal, but um, when we did the, the Vaikha Torah portion, we looked at the idea of the grain offering. What does a piece of grain have to do to be bread? You pluck it, you crush it, you sieve it, then you pound it into a dough, then you stick it in the oven, and then you get to put it on the fire of the altar. Count it all joy, right? Will you accept the discipline and reproof that comes with being refined, wherever that comes from? Whether it's directly from him, if you're so lucky, whether it be through circumstance, whether it be through one another. Will you walk before him and be perfect? Have integrity. Will you have integrity so that when you do stumble, you just pick yourself up? You know, I'm, I'm at the point in, in my walk now where I can say, Father, I, I'm, I'm honest with my feelings. Like a few years ago, I was angry at him. It took me a while to realize that. And I had to admit that to him and say, Father, I'm angry at you because of this, that, and the other. But the anger soon went away. He dealt with me in a loving sort of, you know, and he walked me through it, but I had to have integrity. He's not surprised that we've fallen, right? Will you be wise? Will you be foolish? Hopefully today he's given you a better understanding of what that means. Amen. 